this is a story I got from a man named Adam. And here's what he writes. This is pretty good. I'm a 15-year veteran of the Canadian Armed Forces, and I've been deployed overseas several times. I've been shot at, and I've been stabbed once. I don't get shaken easily in high-stress situations, and I'm not prone to panic. On top of this, I've been camping since I was 9 years old, and by 15, I was solo camping for extensive periods in all seasons. I've camped in every season, and I've had many encounters with wildlife. I'm telling you all this to give you a reference to not only my credibility and experience, but also my ability to keep calm under pressure. And I've told very few people of the events that I'm about to tell you. And in telling you, I really want to keep what I can of my career. I'm like most who share their encounters with others. I've been ridiculed and I've been called a liar. And this has made me hesitant to tell my story. But with that said, you come across as a straightforward man who thinks critically, but you also give people the benefit of the doubt, which, even as a skeptic, still provokes trust. I've been going to the same property in Tamagami, Ontario, for 25 years. This is a large acreage that backs on to Crown land that was owned by my late great-grandfather. There's a lake on this property that I've enjoyed for not only its peace and quiet, but its beauty. On October the 9th, 2020, I traveled here for a one-week camping trip before the winter set in. I come here twice a year, but this year, due to COVID, I didn't get a chance to go until October. I arrived early in the day, and I unlocked the gate, and I drove in on the two-kilometer old logging road to its end, where I got out and grabbed my gear, including a 12-gauge semi-auto shotgun. I brought the shotgun due to it being fall, and the black bears have a tendency to get a bit aggressive as it's closing in on their hibernation season. I left my truck for the 1.5-kilometer hike to the lake. The day was going great at this point. After setting up camp, I relaxed, and I sat by the fire until after dark. And I was turning in for the night, and I saw ice shine not far off that was seven to eight feet off the ground. When I turned my head to look, there was nothing. I saw it out of the corner of my eye. Even so, the hair on the back of my neck stood up. Well, I shook it off and quickly assumed that it was light from the fire reflecting off some leaves, maybe, but that was enough to keep me relaxed again. I let the fire die out a bit, and then I lay down in the tent, and immediately after getting settled in, I discovered there were no animal or insect sounds. Now, even in the fall, some of the birds were active in the area, and in addition, there were no other animal sounds that I was used to. There was only the sound of a light breeze and water rolling onto the bank. I was shocked awake at 1.14 a.m. I heard something. I couldn't identify it coming out of a deep sleep. My watch told me that it was not yet morning. Laying there, relaxed for several minutes, trying to decide if the sound I heard was from a dream or if it was real, and I heard the first growl from my 8 o'clock. It was a vibrating low sound that didn't match anything I had heard, and instantly I sat up. This was real. There was no dreaming happening now. I could hear leaves crunching under heavy footfalls and it heightened my senses. It was moving from my left to right, ending at my 11 o'clock, where another growl rumbled into my tent. My rational mind knew it was a bear, even though the sound was different. Slowly, I slipped out of my sleeping bag while pulling the shotgun closer to my side. I was slipping on my boots when I heard the same growl from the same position as before, and I yelled out at the animal, hoping to scare it off. Wildlife, even predators, will leave the immediate area, or they'll back off when they hear human voices. But that's not what happened this time. I was answered with the same growl, and it was more intense. The animal was out in front of my tent. Flipping the safety off, I pointed the shotgun toward the entrance of the tent and then reached to unzip the fly. I wanted to see what I was shooting at if it came to that. 
I moved the barrel out of the tent door and pulled the fabric aside to better see. First the right and then the left. I didn't see anything. I didn't move for a few minutes and I just listened. I needed to know where it was so when I came out I could get it in front of me. But it never made another sound. I moved toward the opening, crawling with my left arm for support and the gun in my right. And I would pop up and search for the target when I was clear of the tent. But before my head had cleared the tent opening, I was snatched out of the tent in a violent motion. A bear would have bitten me to pull me out or would have been gouged with claws, but that wasn't what had me. It was a grip. Something had its hand wrapped around my arm. And faster than I could process what was happening, it had me out of the tent. Reflexively, I squeezed the trigger and the gun boomed in the darkness, aimed at nothing. Roaring, the creature swung me in several directions. The world had turned into a nightmare of tumbling and impacts until there was intense pain in my head, and then I blacked out. My eyes tried to flicker open, and it was daylight. My left shoulder was hurting terribly. With my right arm, I got to a sitting position. After getting my bearings, I began to look over my body for injuries. My left eye was closed and caked in blood. I wiped some of that away and looked at the shoulder that was in pain and I saw it was dislocated. That and the gash over my left eye seemed to be the only major injuries. My legs were okay, which meant I could walk. Now to assess where I was. My tent and my campsite was not there. I couldn't see it. I was in a different place in the forest. There were drag marks in the dirt. It was plain to see that I had been brought to this location. I used the GPS watch to try to figure out where I was, and I was astonished to see that I was a half mile away from my campsite. I wasn't going back there, so I set my GPS to where I had parked, and it was actually closer than my campsite. Thank goodness for small miracles. The walk to the vehicle took twice as long as it would have had I not been injured, but I made it. And during the walk, the feeling of being watched was as strong as I had ever felt in my life. I unlocked the door, and a loud roar came from the area of my campsite, maybe a bit closer. That's all I needed to hear to get moving. I started the engine and peeled out of there throwing gravel and dirt, not caring if I damaged the vehicle. I stopped at the medical center in Tamagami, where after examining my shoulder they told me I needed surgery to repair the damage if I wanted to use that arm again. I would need to go to a larger facility that could do the surgery. There were more cuts and bruises on me than I thought. I had a concussion and my scalp was glued back in place, and the doctor stitched other cuts. My left forearm was black and blue from the grip the creature had on me. Days later, I was recovering in a hospital room from the surgery that repaired the torn muscles, ligaments, and cartilage in my left shoulder. And on my last day there, the county police came in to take a statement. Well, I told them the truth as best as I knew what that was. I never saw the animal that dragged me out of the tent and into the woods, and in their report it was concluded a bear had attacked me. Well hell, I knew it wasn't a bear. Whatever yanked me out of that tent had a grip on me. Had it been a bear, there would have been teeth or claw marks on my arm. Within a few days, both my brother and my father went back to the campsite to gather my stuff and they found it destroyed. The tent, the pack, the clothes, and sleeping bag were shredded and tossed around. The shotgun stock was split in half and the barrel was bent. The pile of wood was thrown around everywhere. My brother and father said they didn't see or hear anything, but the entire time they were there, they felt like they were being watched. None of my family has ever felt that feeling like they were unwanted at this property, and that's how my father described it. To date, I have permanent mobility loss of 30% and constant nerve pain in my left shoulder. My career is now limited and I'm clueless to what really happened. 
I've never been afraid of the forest, but I dreaded going back there for over a year, and I still won't go there alone. I still have nightmares, and I take medication to sleep, and I was diagnosed with PTSD from the event in 2021. I've had plenty of time to think of why I was attacked. It obviously wasn't happy with me being there, but I think it was the shotgun that set it off, and when it fired, all bets were off, so to speak. I still don't understand why it let me live. You are free to share this story on your channel, and you can use my first name, but please keep my email and last name confidential. I also will not give the details of the exact location in Tamagami. My family doesn't want every Tom, Dick, and Harry with a Bigfoot fetish to show up. It's still our land, and we like our peace and quiet. Thank you for your time, and he signs off Adam. Oh, I thought that was a... I mean, it was traumatic for him. I mean, imagine getting yanked out of a... Your worst case, you're assuming it's a bear. You know, bears, I guess... I guess they, I think I've heard stories of them grabbing people in their tents and carrying them off. But I mean, that normally is not what happens. That, you know, bears, when they see or hear humans, unless they're humanized, what's the, unless they're real used to humans, like in, um, there are several places. Heck, we were in Gatlinburg for that uh, conference uh, a couple of weeks ago. And my wife and I get up early, and we, we like our coffee, and, and the coffee in the hotel room was horrible. You know, it's those little coffee makers they put in the rooms, and oh man, that coffee is stale. So we jumped in the car, and it was still almost just barely daylight. We were driving around Gatlinburg trying to find someplace open where we could buy a cup of coffee. And we're coming down, I think it's the main drag in Gatlinburg. I'm not real familiar with all the roads and stuff, but I think it's the main drag. There was a dadgum black bear in the middle of the street. It had it had dug some garbage out of a garbage can, and it was tearing a bag open. Actually, it was on the sidewalk. We were in the street, but then it ran across the street. It didn't run toward the woods. It ran toward the town. So that thing... And it kind of ran through an alley, and I thought, oh my gosh, I feel sorry for anybody walking, taking an early morning walk down that alley. Anyway, that for some reason, the, talking about bears made me think about this uh, this bear we saw in Gatlinburg. But back to the story, I mean, you're sticking your head out of a tent, and you, you're, you're fully anticipating running a bear or some kind of animal, even if it is a predator, normally they'll leave. You know, if you show, if you show, if you show them you're big and talk to them or yell at them or stuff they'll turn around and leave most of the time you get a quarter way out of the tent and whoop up you're jerked up in the air and slammed around on the ground and against trees and you're knocked out and then you're dragged a half a mile from your tent and you wake up the next morning i cannot imagine going through that so i guess i kind of understand why the man has a bit of ptsd I mean, I think there are different levels of PTSD, and it's probably everyone is susceptible to it. But anyway, I thought this was a wonderful story, even though it was hard on the man it happened to. But it's wonderful for us to hear. It's very exciting. So I appreciate Adam for sending it, and let's go to another one. Hey, y'all, what's going on? This is Cam Buckner, and this is the Dixie Cryptid Podcast, also known as the What If It's True Podcast out on the Podcast Network. Haven't put a podcast up in uh, almost a week, so this is, uh, I don't know how long this is going to be, but it's, uh, it's, it's four really good stories that I think you all are going to enjoy. They're all Bigfoot stories except one. Real quick, before we get back into the podcast, I want y'all to know that Yeti Bars has a new bar. I don't know if this is something they're going to continue to make or not, but I think it's called the Forest Fresh Bar. I bought one from them at the Gatlinburg conference, and I have used that bar of soap up in a week. I've been t like taking extra showers because I love the smell. It's got this, it's a black bar of soap, and it's got this real piney, kind of manly, woodsy smell to it. It's not the patchouli. It's, it smells like pine tar, and man, I, I think I have a new favorite bar from Yeti Bars. It's called the Forest Fresh take a look at it at yetibars.net or yetibars on facebook when you get ready to check out i'm about to order about 10 bars of that stuff and i'm going to use the code dc10 when i check out 
and get a 10% discount, it's a good deal. And I think most of their soaps are on sale right now. And in this time of inflation, you're not going to find that very often. Go check them out at YetiBars.net and YetiBars on Facebook and buy some of that Forest Fresh soap. I think you're going to love it. All right, let's get back into the podcast. All right, here we go. Okay, here's another Bigfoot story. Uh, The man wants to be anonymous, and here's what he writes. I'm a pastor from Memphis, Tennessee. Back in the 1990s, I moved to a rural area south of Jackson, Tennessee to serve at the church here. As a kid in the 1970s, I watched the Patterson-Gimlin film and The Legend of Boggy Creek. I wanted to believe in Bigfoot, but even if it were true, I seriously doubted there were any in Tennessee. And then I read a book about a Bigfoot encounter in Carroll County, Tennessee that shook me to my core. On October 11, 2002, the church I was serving had planned a camp out for the kids. We put up eight tents near the pond in a pasture located in Hardeman County near the Madison County line. To the east of the pasture were woods and to the south was a creek that ran along some heavily wooded bottomlands. The house of the church family who owned the land was 150 yards to our north, and we had 12 kids with us, including my two children and six adults. My wife and I, along with our two children, were in one tent together. In the late afternoon on the day of the camp out, the landowner's son and I set up the tents and we got the camp ready, and after supper, we went on a scavenger hunt. We stayed mainly around the pond that was to our west near a grove of trees. During the hunt, I couldn't shake the eerie feeling of being watched from those trees. The evening went without incident. By 11 o'clock, we all turned in. And not long after I entered my tent, I heard a powerful and frightening howl to our northeast. Then I heard a second howl coming from the same direction. Those were answered by a faint howl coming from the woods to our southeast. I don't remember how many howls I heard in total. I just remember that I was quite frightened by them. My wife was awake and she heard them too. And our daughter, who was in another tent with some of the girls, later told us that she'd heard the howls too. A few minutes of silence passed and I decided to go outside of the tent. I wanted to watch the fence row and the woods beyond it to make sure that we weren't being approached by whatever was out there howling, and I wanted to add wood to the fire. I kept my eye on the woods as I approached the fire, but I didn't see anything. The landowner's Jack Russell Terrier was sitting in a lawn chair by the fire, and I could tell by how still and alert he was that he was just as frightened as we were. I didn't hear anything the rest of the night, though. After that camp out, I decided to investigate what I'd heard. Now listen to the Ohio howl by an alleged Bigfoot. That howl is a long moaning sound with a dog barking. What I heard that night was closer and louder, and there were no other sounds except the answering howl. It was very quiet before the howls and deadly quiet afterward. One thing I know for certain, whatever made those howls was a large creature. Next, I spoke to the landowners. They told me they'd had numerous encounters with ape-like creatures on their property and in the surrounding area. Now remember, I was their pastor, and there was absolutely no reason why they would lie to me about this. In January of 2003, I was invited over to the landowner's house to investigate the woods where I'd heard the howls. Their son and I ventured into the woods to the east around 3 o'clock in the afternoon, and then we traveled south. It had snowed, so we were hoping to find some tracks. Five yards into the woods, we came across a large X shape formed by two trees that had been pushed over. And as we continued, we found other territorial markers, such as saplings that were twisted down five to seven feet off the ground. My companion was familiar with these sites, but had never investigated to find out what had been done. We came across one track that was roughly 12 inches in length. We also found a manure pile of unknown origin and some hair caught on a fence row. 
My companion had hunted and fished his whole life. He was familiar with a wide variety of animals, but he couldn't identify either the scat or the hare. And last, we found what were possibly bedding areas for something extremely large. We searched for two more hours, and then we headed back to the house. In February of that same year, the landowner's son and I visited the October campsite at 8.30 p.m. in the evening. We sat down and talked for a while, but mainly we were listening for what we had begun to call our friends. Friends is our code word for Bigfoot. Not long after we got there, we heard an owl hooting, and it was answered by a mimicking sound. But we looked at each other as if to say, what was that? And then it happened again, and we knew it was Bigfoot. When we didn't hear anything else for a few minutes, we decided to head back to the house. And we knew we needed to come back with night vision binoculars sometime in the future if we were going to see anything. I have had several more encounters, including an actual sighting. And I'll send you those stories soon. Well, very good. I'd love to have your sighting story, sir, the pastor from Memphis. I, uh, this is interesting. These are people who have heard, you know, it's, it's, a uh, this word is so commonly used, but it's anecdotal type stuff like the owl hooting and then getting answered by another howl or another owl. Does that not sound like owls talking back and forth? I have owls back here behind my house and some, you know, some owl will start raising sand down in these bottoms. And then uh, all the way on the other side of the woods, I'll hear another one calling back. That doesn't necessarily mean it's a Bigfoot. I'm not arguing with the man, but I'm wondering how they come to these conclusions. And he didn't say it in his story, but are they typically, can, can you listen to him and tell that that is something mimicking an owl? That's what I'm asking. And so I'd be curious about that. If anybody in the audience listens to this, can you tell the difference between some, uh like, for instance, a human doing an owl hoot or an actual owl hooting. I use an owl hoot call turkey hunting all the time. Sometimes, uh, you know, it doesn't work all spring, but it's usually about the first month of uh, turkey season. If you'll hoot, if, they're, if the turkeys are still up on the roost, especially if it's just getting daylight, you can blow that owl call, man. They'll all sound off. But you get later in the season, and they don't do, they don't seem to do it as much. So it's not like foolproof. But the point is, I have an owl call, and to me, it sounds like an owl. And I've had owls call back at me when I use it. And uh, anyway, I'm just rambling on about this owl thing. But it, but this is one of those cases where a man hears some things. He's heard a few things about Bigfoot, and he's investigating. He's real interested in this, and I think that's cool. I think if that's uh, that's something you enjoy doing, that is, and you have time to do it, that's a fun thing to do. I know a lot of people who do it, and they love it. They absolutely love it. So thank you to the pastor for sending this. Preacher, send me some more stories on your sightings. I'd love to hear them. Okay, this is a story. This is a little bit of a non-typical story. There's uh, there's no huge theme here or any kind of point climax in the story that will shock you, but it's a really fun email from a gentleman in Atlanta that I read a couple of weeks ago, and I thought I'm going to put this in a podcast because it's really kind of fun. It's serious, but it's kind of fun. So let me just read it and let's see if you enjoyed as much as I did. Let's see, the man writes, Welcome to my first night on Battlefield Avenue. My stories don't have anything to do with Bigfoot. I've never had that experience, but the stories about my house are true events that I have experienced. My friend Raj owns this house, and he's from India. He raised his sons here, and when I told him about the spirits that live here, he just laughed at me. Well, after a few minutes, he asked if it bothered me. I had to say no. Haven't had any negative experiences. So let me jump in and tell you a little bit about them. My name is of no concern to the readers or listeners. My house is in such a geographically specific place that it is easy to find. If you research any history about General McPherson and his death, you will find a treasure trove of information. This is the history of Battlefield Avenue. It's only three blocks long now. 
when I-20 plowed through Atlanta, my street was significantly shortened. I live here by myself with two crazy cats, and I have lots of work to do on this old house, and I don't get lonely. I'm retired from the movie industry, and I get a check from Social Security, and I try to get to the end of each month. I was a special effects fabricator, so if you drive down my streets, you'll see my cats and my work in the front of the house. I never call it my house. I'm not here alone, and the spirits that call this home have been here and will be here after I'm gone. The work is never ending here. There's not a single miter joint in the whole house. Nothing is up to code. The first time I took the cover off the electrical panel, I thought I was going to die. There were ground wires that were barely attached, and everything had the appearance of being hand-tightened or just in place, ready to be locked down and tightened from the installation. There was no master breaker either, so I put on my rubber gloves and grabbed what I hoped was a well-insulated screwdriver. Needless to say, I learned something about electrons when I was younger, so a lot of my mystery circuits started working a whole lot better. There's an LED strip over my couch, and it still didn't work. It has two switches, one by the door for a light and a separate switch for the ceiling fan that I wanted to put in. I took the ghost lights down and I tossed them, and when I came in from the trash, the kitchen lights blinked. And when I say blinked, I should say strobe like a disco. I thought the door closing might have just helped me find another loose wiring problem, so I slammed the door several times, but it didn't blink anymore, and I replaced the bulb with a new one, and I went back to work. My cats are so funny. One is black. His name is Merlin because he thinks he's invisible. He is, most of the time, when I'm not wearing my glasses, asleep in my black chair. His brother's name is Mervin. Mervin. Mervin is huge and he weighs 14 pounds and has weird spots on his back like a bobcat. His tail is like a small chain which he uses to clear off my desk when it thunders. I call it my accessory. It doesn't matter what you name your cats. They only come to you when they want something. They are part of this eyewitness story. One afternoon, I was about to climb up on the roof from the back patio, and I heard a lady's voice, and she plainly called my name. Well, I was shocked, and I turned, and I expected to see someone on the porch, and there was no one there. The hair stood up on my arms when these things happened, and I have that feeling now as I type this into my computer. It's like electricity or static. I don't know how to describe it. I just go with the energy. The lady is plainly only one of my roommates, unless she also pulls on my shirt. One afternoon, I was working on a guitar, and I felt a tug on my sleeve. I turned, expecting to see Merlin on the arm of my chair, and there he was, asleep on the chair behind me. Mervin likes to climb up to the highest point in the room, so he was on the armoire. <laughs> he says he doesn't know how to spell it. I, I don't know how to spell that either. I, I think it's A-R-M-O-I-S, maybe? Anyway, armoire, and he was fast asleep. Again, the hairs on my arms stood up. Once when I tried to get up from the chair, I felt like my shirt was caught on something right behind my back, like a hand pulling me back down or a bungee cord. The shirt tug was just the beginning of a lot of physical manifestations. I also have a big attic, tin roof, and a fireplace that heats the kitchen in the bedroom. I've heard a lot of noise from the attic, mostly squirrels. One day, I was in the kitchen. Merlin was laying in the exact middle of the room, licking his butt. Sorry, that's what cats do when they're bored. They always have to be right in the center of my way. Well, I heard footsteps from the attic. And it was no mistake, someone was walking just above my head. Above the kitchen, the roof is low. There's no way to walk, not upright on two feet. I looked down at Merlin, and he had stopped licking his butt. <laughs> and he was staring at the ceiling just like I had been. And that's when I realized I wasn't hearing things. The light flicker is my other roommate. He rings the doorbell and makes me think I have a bad bulb by making it get dim or flash. He seems to be the one with a sense of humor. 
Yeah, it's funny as hell to turn off or just flash the bathroom light when it's dark and I'm in the shower. He does it all the time. Sometimes I think he's acting like a little kid. And I wonder if this is also the middle of the night door knocker too. Oh yeah, I have two doors in the front. The patio has tools and my solar system battery, so I keep the outside door locked at night. The doorbell is also on the inside door. Usually the knocker comes around 4 a.m. Sometimes it's three soft knocks and that's all, but a couple of times it's been followed by five or six loud bangs. And one time the doorbell wouldn't stop and the alarm system went off. Well, that would be okay, but the alarm system is not wired up and it does not work. So I'm glad my life is filled with the knowledge that when my physical shell is gone, I can come back and mess with the living. There's more to come from Battlefield Avenue. Well, that was just a short, short email, and I thought it was kind of comical. And this man has a, a great attitude toward this stuff, and he's having fun with it. And, you know, we, we always tend to be afraid of these things, and maybe sometimes we don't need to be. Maybe sometimes we just need to keep a good light attitude toward the things like this gentleman on Battlefield Avenue is going through and just kind of roll with it and have fun with it and just assume these things are not evil or not assume that they're evil and just kind of wait them out. He seems to have found out that these things aren't evil or bent on hurting him yet. He hasn't figured that out yet or hasn't discovered that yet. So I thought it was a great story and I wanted to share it with you. The story is titled, The Tobermory Teasers. On August 29th, 1980, I drove to Tobermory. Reports of balls of light were being observed over Lake Huron near Cape Heard. This intrigued me enough to pack the van and hit the road to check it out. Once I reached Cape Heard, I searched for a viewing area. I drove down dirt roads in the general direction of Lake Huron, pulling off in various lanes hoping that one of them would open up to a public beach where I could view, but I ended up at a group of private cottages. Finally, I found a suitable place where I could park my van. Now that I had a viewing area, I went to Tobermory to a local restaurant. As I waited for my food, I saw two young men enter the restaurant. Both appeared to be in their early 20s. One had blonde hair and large, sensitive eyes. The other man was thin-faced and black-haired. They were completely human-looking, but I felt a strange psychic stirring when I saw them. Seating themselves at a nearby table, they ordered something to eat. I kept picking over at them during my meal. Each time they met my gaze with knowing looks. I eventually began to feel a little silly about the whole affair, and I decided to ignore them. I paid and left without any further acknowledgement of their presence. I walked to the OPP station nearby, and I spent a few minutes talking to the officer on duty about any reports of strange aerial phenomenon observed in the area over the years. Twilight was fast approaching, Grimacing at the thought of spending the night at a lonely campsite with no munchies on hand, I stopped at a small variety store to stock up on treats. No sooner had I made my purchase when the same two men I had seen at the restaurant walked in and surveyed the merchandise, frequently peering in my direction. Once again, I experienced a psychic connection which surfaced as confusion and an ill at ease feeling. I left right then and went to the grocery store next door to do my shopping. Being short on money, I had been living on sandwiches, and my only wild financial extravagance was that supper at the restaurant. I felt I needed to round out my diet. Browsing in the pudding and pastry aisle, my old desires died hard, I noticed that the two men were literally following my footsteps. I hurried to the checkout and I filed through, keeping a wary eye on both of them. They stood off to the side waiting for me to pay and leave. My van was parked right outside, so I climbed in and I watched to see what would happen next. Both men seemed concerned by my focused attention on them. 
They kept glancing at me while the cashier rang up their purchases. When they stepped out the door, the blonde-haired man said, Let's go back in here, and they disappeared into the variety store again. I waited until they came out, determined to find out which car in the parking lot belonged to them. I suspected on a deeper level that they didn't have any transportation, at least nothing that we use in this world. I settled in, and I was unwilling to budge. In the middle of this determined state to see what car they were going to get in, I had a sudden thought surface in my mind. It's late, and I better get to the viewing area before it gets dark. I started the van, and I drove away. I was halfway to the viewing area before I remembered why I had been sitting there and about my resolve to wait for the two strangers to reappear. I puzzled over the inexplicable change of mind and forgetfulness that I had so quickly and powerfully experienced. I was certain that the thought hadn't been my own. I knew there was no use going back. Those two would be gone by now. I pulled off the road onto a rough-hewn lane which led to a small wedge of land next to the lake. It was barely light enough for me to study the landscape. I stepped out of the van and surveyed the scene. I was backed by forest, and I faced the shore, separated from it by a narrow bush-dotted rock-strewn strip. A small patch of black and gray tinged clouds rolled against the light of the moon, but with the turn of my head, I saw the clear night sky and brilliant stars beginning to show on all sides. My gaze returned to the clouds. I had never seen clouds move in in such a boiling manner before. I reached for my flashlight sweeping the murky area, and I searched for the shortest and safest route to the lake. Just as I decided to take what looked like a fairly easy pathway across the rocky divide, I suddenly lowered the flashlight, turned, and I climbed back into my van. I looked at the clock, and it was 9.30 p.m. I sat on the van's bed, wondering why I had so abruptly changed my mind about going to the shore. A few raindrops had splattered on the windshield. Of course, I told myself, that's why I came back inside. It's going to rain. I'll sit here and wait until it stops. For some reason, I had forgotten about the clear, starry night sky. The only clouds present were the oddly behaving ones in front of the moon. I switched off the flashlight, and I sat in the dark, listening to the surging heartbeats of Lake Huron, each wave pulse breaking on the shore with a rumble. I slowly sat up. I didn't recall even laying down and I grabbed the flashlight and aimed it at the clock. It read 4 a.m. I gasped and I groaned. Damn, I cursed silently. I must have fallen asleep. The night is almost over and I haven't done any viewing. It's not dawn yet, I added aloud with resolve. I'll get out there now and do some viewing. Stepping out of the van, I noticed that the ground didn't look wet from the rain, and that was odd. I was sure that it had rained. I took only a couple of steps towards the lake before I came to a sudden halt. I wanted to go to the shoreline, but something was stopping me. I kept hearing in my mind to leave right now. Shaking my head, I tried to dismiss the thought, but it was too strong and urgent to be ignored. I found myself scrambling back into the van, starting the motor, and racing away from the area. I felt like I was in danger. On the way home, I fought the most intense drowsiness that I had to finally pull over into a parking lot and sleep for a while to be able to safely continue driving. That didn't make sense. If I had fallen asleep at 9.30 the previous night and slept until 4 the next morning, I should have had six and a half hours of sleep. The tiredness I experienced was equal to being awake all night. Thinking back over everything strange that occurred, I came to the realization that maybe I didn't have six hours of sleep. What had happened to me that night? 
To this day, I don't know, but I suspect it had something to do with the Tobermory teasers. All right, I have time to do one more story, and then I got to get back to work. So this uh, this story is also sent in by an anonymous writer, and here's what he writes. A few years ago, I was sitting home alone on Saturday night, and I was looking for something to do, and I couldn't find anyone to hang out with, so I headed north to a secluded spot that I used to frequent to do a little target shooting. The moon was bright in the lonely Arizona desert at night, and I drove seven miles down a two-lane highway to where a hidden dirt trail took me a mile and a half to another trail that wrapped around the mountain. My plan was to fire each of the weapons that I'd brought until they were empty and then head back home. The whole time I was there, I couldn't shake the feeling that I was being watched. Man, that is a huge theme of this podcast, isn't it? Everybody feels like they're being watched. Anyway, back to the story. I had tracked movement on the mountainside 50 meters away when I got there. and It looked like large piercing eyes of a towering being, but I wrote it off as a coyote or something that only looked big because of the angle I was viewing it from. I figured it would run off when I started firing. The first gun I planned to fire was a pistol. I took an aim and I pulled the trigger and click. That's odd, I thought. And I racked the slide and a round fell out. And I pulled the trigger again. Click. For seven rounds, it was click, rack, drop. Well, I must have some bad ammo, I told myself. I picked up my 1851 and I cocked it and I squeezed the trigger. Click. The cap didn't discharge. I tried it again. It didn't discharge again, and there was a hiss from the fourth attempt indicating a partial ignition, but other than that, all five rounds were duds. It was a piece of crap anyway, I said. Next was my hunting rifle. It was my favorite, so I brought two stripper clips, and I cycled it, and click. Every round was cycle, rinse, repeat in both magazines. It was the same for every other gun I'd brought with me that night and I'd brought quite a few. The best I'd managed was one partial ignition in my 1851. Months later, I tried this same ammo and the same guns, and I had no problems at all. My frustration with my weapons took a back seat when I suddenly tasted a pungent, foul smell followed by the sound of footsteps. And I glanced back up to where I had seen the eyes earlier, and it was back and I got the impression that it was glaring at me. Adjacent to it, on the other hillside, were two or three more sets of eyes, and I looked around and I saw five more figures down in the valley. In unison, they all moved in on me, and I left all the guns in the bed of my truck, and I slammed the tailgate shut and jumped in the cab and turned the key to start it. The fear was swelling in my stomach and it jumped into my throat when I realized that my truck, for the first time ever, failed to start. I turned the key again. Nothing. And three more times I turned that key and then finally, as a delayed reaction, it sprang to life. I threw it into drive and I mashed the accelerator. And twice it spun in the soft sand and the cacti before it caught and lurched forward. I never dropped it below 30 miles per hour until I hit the asphalt where I pushed the speedometer to 100. I opted to take the interstate home that night and stay off the dinky desert back roads. As I drove, I called my girlfriend to help calm me down, but that didn't work. So I called my buddy who was always out there with me, and when I told him everything that had happened, he and I had the same thought. Well, I'm so anal about my guns... Having even one act up is a rarity, but all of them? I happened to glance down at the clock as we were talking, and it was 1 a.m. I left home at 8 p.m. I drove 45 minutes to the spot, and I was there for less than an hour and was back on the highway in less than 20 minutes, talking to my friend on the phone. It shouldn't have been any later than 10 p.m., but it was 1 a.m. How did that much time pass so quickly? And to this day, I have no explanation for it. When I got home that night, I pulled the powder from the black powder rifles to investigate, and every one of them had exactly the same amount of powder they would have if they'd been fired. 
I waited till the next morning to go check my Kentucky rifle, but all the measurements were right. I'll never go out to the desert alone at night again. It's been a few years since this happened, and it still shakes me up to go out at night at all. I won't write what I know these creatures to be. I am superstitious, and after that night, I don't want to take any chances. It's taken me years just to write down this incident at all. I'm writing it now because a few days ago I went back. I had to get some answers. My friend came with me this time, and we arrived before the sun set and we walked the whole area. The spot where I first saw the eyes is inaccessible by humans. The distance they covered when they moved in on me was too far and too difficult to do in the time that they'd done it. We found evidence of dwellings made by something beside coyotes and javelinas. And the Palo Verde tree that had been snapped off seven feet off the ground and bent down to create a wall that blocked the sun on that side. We climbed up to it and found scratch marks that looked suspiciously like claw marks, and the ground underneath it had been picked clean of stones. Considering the fact that the entire area was made of stones, that was a bit odd. As night drew near, we walked further down to the U-shaped valley, and I made a fire to burn some of the range trash left by other people. I was hoping it would draw in the prying eyes I'd seen before. It was uneventful until it wasn't. I heard a rustling of what I thought was a rabbit or a coyote in the bushes to our east, and seconds later, I saw a figure crossing the slope we had just walked down. I knew immediately that it was not a hiker. I trained my rifle on it and watched as it traversed the hard terrain, and it stopped behind a tree that partially blocked my view. It was too dark to get a clear picture, but I could see well enough to know that the creature was staring at us, and it didn't like what we were doing. A feeling of ill intent swept over me, and I realized that I may not like what this creature was planning. It stood behind the massive Palo Verde for five minutes, staring through a fork in the tree that I knew was well over six feet above the ground. I was not comfortable with the idea of being stared at by one of these things that had run me off years before. My buddy suggested that I fire a warning shot, and I managed to prune a large branch above its head, and the branch fell at its feet as the shot echoed through the valley, but the creature never moved. A few minutes later, we decided it was time to leave, and I maintained my staring contest with the beast while my buddy packed up. I knew not to back down to this animal. I've always been told they'll charge, and if I turn my back, but if I stay firm, they'll be more wary. Although I didn't see any others that night, I felt their presence as we drove back around the mountain. The Sonoran Desert is my home. I grew up here, and I camped here since I was a kid, and I know the Native Americans who have lived here since long before the Europeans arrived. I've shared this story with them, and they've told me their own tales. I don't know for certain what these creatures are, but I'm sure that you can guess the name that I would give them. The supernatural is never my first thought, but if anyone else has an explanation, I'd love to hear it. What I need most of all is answers. And that's the end of his email. That That's interesting. That's two. One night he goes out. Let, let me say this. This man uh, gave, I, I think it was one or two paragraphs listing all of the black powder rifles that he uses. And guys, sometimes I take those out. So when I was reading off the gun types and, and it probably didn't make sense to you, but that's not the that's not the thrust of the story he was out shooting black powder rifles he's obviously a collector and he doesn't just put them on his walls he uses them he takes them out and shoots them which i think is very cool so to the writer i took a lot of your gun stuff out because i think it would confuse the audience and i'd kind of lose them but anyway you've got two incidents here you've got the first one where he's out there shooting at night time why would you do that it just kind of raised that question in my head. But he's out there shooting at night, and then then he goes back, you know, a, a, while, a while later with his buddy, and he has another encounter in the same place. So I don't know what to make of it. And the fact that none of your rounds went off, could there be an explanation for that? 
He took them to other areas and they fired just fine. The powder was still all in the rifles. You know, it's just the caps weren't igniting the black powder. So I don't know, maybe it was extra damp that night, but that, unless it's just real damp, usually that doesn't uh, inhibit a black rifle, a black powder rifle from shooting. I don't know much about that stuff. So anyway, I thought this was a great story and I really appreciate the writer sending it. And thank you. I really appreciate it. Thanks for following along with this podcast and we will see you guys on the next one. Love you all. Have a good week. We'll see you next time.